Thanks, Darius, for the tweets this morning. In layman's terms, can you explain last night's note put out by Darius? It would appear that the sine curve may have been starting the bottoming process in Q3 and will continue to deteriorate into Q1. Can you overlay that against the probable outcome for equity beta going forward? Can you also comment on the, how the Fed raising in December is or is not very dovish? Well, in, in layman's terms, let's just go to slide five, Josephine, if you can. This isn't layman. We don't want to. We don't want to make this so easy that a dog can do it. It's not easy. Uh, so this shouldn't look easy. We've put a lot of time and effort into this model. So again, there's two factors, growth and inflation. That is a layman comment, okay? So growth and inflation, if those are your factors, and rate of change, actually maybe I'll just draw this up. One, growth, and inflation, those are your two factors. Point number two, rate of change, the delta, the rate of change is your fundamental modeling premise. So things are either accelerating or they're decelerating. So within the sine curve, you're either going up or you're going down. Growth and inflation, rate of change gives you four quadrants, okay, that you could be in. Four quads, the quads. So in layman's terms, what Darius's note said was that we're going to be in the second quadrant. That, go back to that picture, Josephine, that's um, second quadrant is when the rate of change in growth and inflation is both going which way, Shane? Up, yes, up. So again, back to this, this is really simple. So I, I guess I just did explain multivariable math across durations with two factors in layman terms. When you go into the second quadrant, you have both growth and inflation are going up, okay? They're both going up at the same time in rate of change terms. Again, in rate of change terms. So if GDP goes from, on this sine curve, goes from 3.3 to 1.5 to 1.7, that's an acceleration. That's, that's, that was the point of the note. Because the retail sales number, which was an October number, which was reported, there's a control group in the retail sales number that has a high impact in GDP. That got us to 1.7. The note was actually data dependent. The note wasn't political. Uh, everything that I just said has nothing to do with Trump and nothing to do with Clinton and has nothing to do with me not liking neither of them. Um, this to this, that's all it is. And it's a super subtle move. But look at the market's expectation on what it could be. The market's expectation, of course, is that growth goes from here to here now. Could happen. Could happen. But what if rate rising interest rates make it not happen? Just asking. How do you discern if the economy is, as a sine curve is bottoming or just playing out in a very shallow way? whether it's due to the very shallow protracted growth phase we've already been through, uh, an administration that is doing their darnest to keep the myth alive for just a few more months until there's an adverse event such as an equity market crash or unexpected bankruptcy of someone like Deutsche Bank. Well, I mean, a lot, there's a lot in that question. So let's just, you know, what I, all the different things that you could say that could affect the sine curve, you can say something political, you can say something tyrannical, you can say something emotional. I don't really hear anything other than the math, okay? That was the point of this morning's early, early look note. Um, I call it, it's mathematical judo, really. I mean, it's all about the data. It's all about the data, that's all it is. You know, the data is measured and mapped. We have 30 days, so if you're looking at GDP and you're stating the sine curve accurately, it peaked again at 3.3% year over year in 2015. That was the top right here, okay? That was the peak of the cycle. Then we saw the slowdown to one, all the way down here, right to the middle, uh, call it one and a half. W what we're saying right now is that our tracker, our GDP tracker just went like this, 1.7% year over year. So I think the question stated appropriately, you get a shallow recovery here. What if you don't get a shot back up to here? What if the sine curve doesn't, doesn't look like that? What if it goes boop, back down? No, that, that's going to be a really good call to make because most people are going to be chock full of quad two at that point. Um, so <laughs> this is not an easy one. 
The best way to answer your question, which I've seen every portfolio manager that I've worked with or worked for, try to answer it with just pure qualitative crap. Yeah, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Use data. Use data. It's far more powerful than what's in our brains. Far more powerful. So we have 30 data points in this model. 30 data points per month. 30 data points per month, which equates to, you know, that's three. We got 90 data points a quarter. 90 times we go to we we look at that thing in a quarter. I ask you, what is the alternative model you could use? Do you have your own model? It's very hard to do by yourself. You look at this shift now to quad two and kind of the you know the move that industrials have had. What are you thinking? You know, how do you think about that right now? Because obviously, and you know, and from a trading perspective, it's something you've been on the short. You were on the short side of starting. You know, yesterday you put another. Right. I mean, out there. so you can have. Uh, I'm going to try this chalkboard. This is. Uh, you guys ready for this? All right. Let's do it. All right. So this chalkboard, and I know some of you don't like the chalkboard. We're going to try it again. We put a little more light in here. Um, so within the risk range process, okay, something that goes from bearish trend, okay, let's just call that a bearish trend. Whatever it's doing, it's just making lower highs and lower lows. That's called a bearish trend. When it starts to bottom, in this, typically a bottom can take a while. It can go like, like that for a, a while, a long time. This one didn't happen for a while. Industrials went from this to this, like straight up, this straight up, okay? Like that. So that's called a phase transition. When this bearish trend is violated to the upside, you don't, in this case, you didn't have, you usually get a bottoming process. That's why I say that bottoms are processes, not points. In this case, it actually was a point. It was a, it was a point in time where people realized that a Republican sweep and Trump was going to be huge potentially for CapEx, manufacturers, et cetera. That doesn't mean, this is the point of the question on, on what do I do now if I miss this? Like if you don't wanna be the, the guy or the gal who's buying it, like right there, and there will be a lot of people who screw that up. Now you gotta look at the immediate term range, okay? The immediate term risk range. So there's a top end of the range and there's a low end of the range. And currently industrials are actually at the top end of their risk range. That doesn't mean that it's not bullish trend. It just means simply that this is a really bad idea to be buying it here when you could buy it at the low end of the range. The low end of the range for industrials is like 2.5% below the market price. So would you, would you prefer to wait for the 2.5% or would you prefer to just buy it because you have to? And that's where you bring in the whole discussion about people chasing performance and having benchmarks. They actually have to. That's why you get the top end of the range because everyone crowds into something after the move.